Uh, Ms. Richards, uh, our witness this afternoon wishes to be known as Kate, does That's she? That's right. So, yes. So, if Miss Ashton, Kate would come up. your full name. Kate Ashton. Take the book in your raised hand and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Thanks. Kate. Um, in 1988, you were diagnosed with a type of cancer of the blood, acute myeloid leukaemia. Is that right? Yes. And you started chemotherapy in the autumn of that year. Yes. You had a number of courses of chemotherapy. And then you underwent a full bone marrow transplant in May of 1989. Yes. Now... I understand from your statement that in the course of your treatment for your cancer, you had multiple transfusions. Is yes. That right? Yes, both during my treatment. Um, most people probably know that your blood counts go down whenever you're given chemotherapy and so on, so you have to have uh, transfusion support in the form of, uh, from, in my case, whole blood and platelets. And uh, that also went on for about um, 12 to 15 months after the bone marrow transplant. I needed weekly transfusions for about a year afterwards. Uh, and I think we can see that from, from some of your medical records. Paul, could we have 1416003, please? And that should come up on the screen in front of you, Kate, I hope. Okay. You should, I hope, see there a letter, 9th of November, 1988... In the last sentence, it referred to you being given a transfusion of platelets, mm -hmm. 1988. Uh, and then if we could have the next exhibit, 1416004, please. This takes us through to... I'll wait till it comes up on screen. So this takes us through to July 1989, and we can see at the end of the first paragraph, it says you were still requiring platelet support at least once a week, and you'd required a couple of blood transfusions since your discharge. Yes. And then if we could go, please, Paul, to 28th of September 1989. Um, in fact, it seems to be essentially to the same effect. It might be the same letter. Oh, the second page of that, please, Paul. There's a letter, 28th of September 1989. That should be coming on the screen in front of you now, Kate, so we can see from that, mm -hmm. uh, from the second paragraph, it refers to you being on regular blood and platelet transfusions. Yes. Uh, and that carried through, I think, pretty much well into the end of 1990. Yes, yes. Um, could we just have up on screen, please, Paul, 1416006. That's a letter of the 10th of December, 1990. And we can see there the reference uh, to... Uh, uh, platelet transfusion, but if we just go to the second page of that letter, this, if you could just highlight the second sentence, please. Thank you. There's a reference there, Kate, to screening yes. for hepatitis C is in hand. Mm -hmm. So this is December 1990. Were you at that time told either that screening for hepatitis C was in hand or told the results of any screening? No, absolutely not, no. Uh, and then you can take that down, thanks, Paul. 
In terms of the transfusions themselves that you'd had over this prolonged period, 88, 89, 1990, mm -hmm. were you ever given any advice or information or warnings in relation to the risks of being exposed uh, to infection? Um, no, not at all. I, I, I sometimes had reactions to uh, transfusions that were sort of immediate. That tends to come sometimes when you have a lot of blood transfusions, but certainly nothing regarding risk of infection or anything like that. Now, in consequence of one or more of those transfusions, you developed hepatitis C. Mm -hmm. Yes. C can you recall when you were first told that you had hepatitis C? Um, it, it's very difficult going back over the years. Um, the, the medical records that I was able to pin down um, mentioned, I think it was 1997, uh, when a doctor first um, recorded that in a letter. And as far as I remember, that was the first time that I knew uh, that was the case. Well, let, we'll have a look at that, Kate. It's 1416009, please. And that's a letter, 15th of April, 1997. Yes. And if we have the second paragraph highlighted, we'll see it says, investigations from her last visit have unfortunately shown that Kate is hepatitis C positive. And this almost certainly relates to her intensive blood product transfusional support post autographed in 1989 prior to routine screening of blood donors. Mm. So that, as far as you're aware, is the first time you were told you had hepatitis yes. C? Yes, yes. Uh, and then if we could just see the whole letter again, please. There's a paragraph towards the bottom of the page which you've circled, which says this, I discussed with her the implications of the finding of hepatitis C, including the risk of developing chronic liver disease and risks of transmission. What can you remember uh, as to what you were told? Um, I actually remember very little. Um, I, I do remember there was a discussion of sorts, and I think um, I was told that I shouldn't share my toothbrush with anybody. Um, I can't remember if any risks of sexual transmission were discussed or not. They may well have been. But the actual implications medically of having hepatitis C um, either weren't discussed or I don't recall them um, because certainly that. I don't recall there being any impacts at that time. And it, it was a bit like um, I knew I'd picked up cytomegalovirus from transfusions, and, and it was kind of nothing. You know, who cares if you're CMV positive or negative sort of thing. And I think at the time, I had no reason to think it was anything different from that. It was just, a, oh, you ha you've got this, by the way. Um, I don't, I don't think uh, the doctor uh, was subsequently criticised, actually, but I, I have to say I, I don't think there was any fault. I think it was just uh, he, um, he was apparently going to refer me to a gastroenterologist who would have discussed things further. Um, but no, um, my understanding at the time was very limited. And I think the way you put it in your witness statement was, was, is that you didn't comprehend what the diagnosis meant in terms of your medical condition or your life. No, no, not at all. Um, and you're absolutely right. The, the doctor whose letter we've just been looking at, um, the, the letter makes reference to there being um, an intention to refer you to a gastroenterologist. Um, you say in your statement that you were essentially lost to follow up from 1997 through to about 2004. Yes. Do, do you know what happened in relation to that referral? Um, I, I don't know. Um, I, I think it, it, you know, it's one of those things that happens. I, I don't think I, as far as I can recall, that I remember being told I was going to be referred. And I think when I didn't receive a letter... Of course, I didn't know that I was expecting a letter, so I probably didn't follow it up from my end. Um, and I, I was not required any further follow-up at that time by the haematologists who I'd been under for uh, treatment. And so um, life just went back to normal. I didn't have to... And it wasn't until a few years later um, that I think 
Uh, I said to my GP once, oh, I was one day diagnosed with hepatitis C. Does that need following up or anything? Uh, and that was quite a number of years later. I think you've got, you've got some recollection of some form of medical interactions potentially in 2004, but it's, it's really only in 2012 that we see matters relating to your hepatitis C yes. being picked up and discussed. Yes. So can we have a look, please, um, at another document? Paul, it's 1416... 011 and this is a letter from King's College Hospital July 2012 we can see just down the bottom of that first page under the heading diagnosis point four it says hepatitis C diagnosed 1992 question mark transfusion acquired as far as you're aware, that's a mistake and the diagnosis was made in 1997, as we've just seen. Yes, and the, the, there are several other letters that say 1997, so I think this was just a, probably a mistype or something. And if we go on to the second page of that letter, please, the second paragraph, we see there a liver biopsy was done in 2012 and uh, stage 4 fibrosis there identified... Uh, and then if we could look further down the page, uh, near where that handwriting is, please, Paul, we discussed the risks and benefits of hepatitis C treatment. She's clearly looked into this. I've encouraged her to do as much reading into this as possible. I is that your handwriting on the side? It is, yes. So your note, when you've looked at your records, is first time hep C really discussed with me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think you were also told around... Um, 2012, the, the genotype of your hep C, which was genotype 3A. Yes. Um, there's, uh, in fact, if we get that up on screen, please, it's 1416012. First paragraph, please. So we can see there the confirmation of the genotype, and then it says this. In particular, the HIV test, which is done routinely in all patients before starting hepatitis C treatment, was negative. Were you aware that you were being tested for HIV? No, I don't think I was. Um, now, I wanted to ask you about the treatment for the hepatitis C mm -hmm. um, and the various different treatment experiences that you underwent. So, um, you first underwent treatment... Uh, uh, with interferon and ribavirin uh, in 2012-2013? Yes. For about 28 weeks was That's the right. intense course yes. of treatment. Yes, yes. What can you tell us about that experience? Um, uh, the experience wasn't as bad as I hear from some other people. Um, I've, I generally felt a bit unwell. Um, <laughs> and... Um, an issue that I think has come from the hepatitis C, but uh, we'll probably touch on a, a different point, uh, has been depression uh, and tiredness generally. And I think uh, it was made worse during that period. Um, but I was able to keep on working. Um, so, you know, I wasn't laid low by it. Um, unfortunately, the treatment didn't work, um, and I was told that that was not so uncommon with my genotype, that um, it didn't always work, so that was it, pretty much. Yes, you've described in your statement that, that you felt poorly and had flu-related symptoms, but as yes. you say, you were able to keep working yes. throughout that treatment. Yes. There was then in 2014 a clinical trial uh, that you were involved in using Savaldi, yes. one of the newer drugs, um, but you had to abandon that for, for unrelated reasons. Yes, I, reasons. I only had one dose of that and um, I, I couldn't carry on with the trial. Uh, and then it was finally in 2017 that you embarked upon a third course of treatment mm -hmm. uh, uh, and that was successful mm -hmm. in the sense that it cleared the hepatitis C virus. Yes, yes. Um, and what you've said in your statement after that three months of treatment, you were finally pronounced clear of the virus in February 2018, but you still have the liver damage. Yes. 
Uh, and you still have to have regular check simulation to that? I do, because the um, degree of cirrhosis is enough to warrant uh, six monthly checks. Were there any particular side effects in relation to that course of treatment, that last course of no, treatment? No, the final course of treatment seemed to be uh, free of side effects as far as I was aware. Now, I want to take you back to the, the, the effect overall of the hepatitis C on you, both mm -hmm. physically and mentally. Mm -hmm. um, what was the main physical effect of the infection? What, what's it been for you? Um, it, it's, it's very hard to specify or quantify. Um, certainly over the years, um, I feel I've become um, more fatigued in daily life, tired than I would expect at my age and, and so on. Um, but, you know, you, you, you don't know who, what to compare to. Um, uh, I've, um, I'd say fatigue was really the main thing. I haven't had any uh, jaundice or any other sort of overt symptoms uh, from the liver damage um, that I can actually point a finger to and say that's definitely the hepatitis. Um, uh, what so about yes. the mental impact? Um, the mental impact, um, I, I would say that in terms of, uh, again, directly s relating to the fact that I have got hepatitis C and these are the consequences, this could happen in the future, um, I can't say that I've suffered a great deal of stress from just the knowledge itself. Um, and um, being a survivor of bone marrow transplants and that sort of thing tends to make you feel, well, gosh, you know, um, it, that, that's, um, you know, you've got through that sort of thing. Um, however, um, over the time since becoming infected uh, and as the years have gone by, um, I have suffered more and more from depression, um, really quite badly at times and uh, I have been told by the liver specialist that depression is something which is quite often linked with hepatitis C so I'm guessing that that's probably the main cause uh, in so far as anybody can tell yeah and you've you've been very candid in your witness statement mm -hmm. about how that affected you in particular from 2011 onwards, yes. when you said the, the fatigue and the depression that you were experiencing as it worsened, you began to plan suicide. Yes, yes I did. Um, I, I had a business, I, I ran a shop, a needlework quilting shop, uh, with a good friend of mine for, I, we started in... Um, 2005 so we'd been running it for about seven years and so on and um, uh, th that was my situation in mid-2012 when uh, the depression reached a point where I, I, I really felt that uh, I, I couldn't just keep going or you know envisage another several decades of feeling the way I felt and I was also although I'm not married and I don't have a family um, I've got very good friends and I realised that the impact of my depression on them was really not good at all, including my business partner. Um, and uh, you kind of feel like you want to release those around you from having to worry about you. Um, but I felt I couldn't do it, couldn't do the deed, while I still was running the business with my friend because I didn't want to leave that responsibility on her. So um, I, I waited until we'd sold the business and you know, sort of really planned it out. And I actually made an attempt on my life when we'd sold the business in February 2013. You gave yourself an injection of insulin 10 times in excess of the normal adult dose. Yes, I did. Um, but you don't know whether you changed your mind or whether you were no. concerned that you hadn't given yourself enough no, to be effective? Um, no, um, about five hours after 
the injection, um, I still wasn't as bad as I thought I ought to be. I was only beginning to have symptoms and um, I, yes, I, I began to think, oh no, I haven't taken enough, I'm going to end up with irreversible brain damage, that's going to be even worse for everybody around me. Um, and I called an ambulance. Uh, I, I didn't consciously change my mind, but who knows, subconsciously maybe I did, I'm not sure. But actually when the attempt didn't succeed, it was a bit of a turnaround point because I thought, well, I'm not going to try again. I, 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 I'm living, I'm still alive, and I've just got to go on and find the best way of doing that that I can and put things into place that will, you know, make life better or, um, yeah. And um, you, you did receive some, some assistance after the events that you've described, in, in fact, through the intervention of, of a police officer. Yes, yes. Um, when I left the hospital, a, a, a couple of police turned up on my doorstep uh, a few hours later saying the hospital had sent them out for me to bring me back because once they'd done the blood test, they realised I'd taken an awful lot more than they thought I had at first. Uh, it was unfortunately, it, well, fortunately, <laughs> I chose um, a form of insulin that was longer acting and it had taken a while to act. And um, it, uh, although the, the hospital uh, didn't offer me any uh, mental health support, uh, this very nice uh, police officer uh, took it upon himself to refer me <coughs> to the mental health services uh, and I saw somebody fairly quickly. Um, it was three and a half years before I finally got to see a counsellor on the NHS, but that's another story. Um, but, uh, but yes, so after about three and a half years, I got to have some therapy for a few months. So you had, I think, initially that your GP prescribed you some antidepressants. Yes. Um, but it was about October 2016 when you first got to see a psychotherapist. Yes. Um, and you had, for a period of time, I think quite a lot of sessions. Yes, a year, uh, a year's worth. Well, ultimately, was it helpful? Um, I suspect not. <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure that it was. Um, I think more long-term help has been... Uh, my very good friends, um, my Christian faith uh, to some extent, although I've struggled with that probably because of the depression, you know, everything's bound up together. Um, but um, uh, I don't know whether it was of help or not. I, I was grateful to receive it because uh, some people don't get that far, but um, yeah, I'm not sure. Can I ask you to, to describe the, the effect, the toll on your on your daily life of the fatigue and depression that you experienced in consequence of the hepatitis C infection? Um, it, it sort of um, increased over the years, I suppose, to the point where um, uh, it's affected work, certainly. Um, Despite my period running a shop for nearly eight years, um, I've spent most of my working life as a um, medical secretary, uh, having originally trained as a doctor many years in my youth, um, but not practised medicine. And um, I uh, began to struggle a lot with um, concentration and uh, that kind of thing. Um, because I was struggling to deal with people um, uh, and an opportunity came up for me to work from home. I opted for that and I probably not very healthily sort of withdrew a bit into my shell and I could work from home and not have to um, deal so much with uh, uh, other people, I guess. Um, but... Uh, I started working for an Australian company, downloading uh, medical um, dictations and typing them or proofreading them. And um, I, end, I was actually fired from one of those jobs uh, just about three years ago now because uh, of lack of concentration. I, I, I sent a couple of the letters back to the wrong client. So obviously that's got data protection implications and it's quite a serious thing to do. Um, 
And most of my working life, I've been really highly thought of, and in fact, even sought after, you know, once I've left a job, the employers have contacted me and said, oh, could you possibly come back and help out? Um, so that's quite humiliating, really, to come to a point where my work is reached, you know, a, a thing where I have to be fired. Uh, and that's really due to concentration issues, uh, motivation, working from home. Um, yes, you said in your statement yeah. that, that that fault for which you were fired, not something you would normally do, yes. you were very upset by it. You were suffering from fatigue and concentration problems because yes. of the hepatitis C. Uh, uh, and then that dismissal had a knock-on effect for you in terms of how you then progressed with your work. Yes. Yes, that's, that's right. And that's obviously a long-term worry. Uh, I'm, I'm still doing some work from home, but um, financially, obviously, there are implications as well. And although I have uh, an income from the Skipton Fund, uh, which I'm very grateful for, and it covers my mortgage payments, uh, it's not enough to cover bills and food and all, you know, all the normal things that we need. So, uh, and I've of course, because of having hep hepatitis C, uh, I can't get any kind of insurance, certainly not indemnity to cover my mortgage or any kind of uh, sickness insurance should I have to stop working or, or take too much time off work sick. Um, so f for the future, that's a difficult thing as well to work out how to, to kind of make way financially. Um, and you, you had a period after you, the, the, the cessation of em, the employment you've described, you, you had to apply for universal credit for a period of time. Yes. Um, uh, which you didn't particularly want to do, but no. you, you felt you had no choice. Then you were able to get some temporary work, uh, and then you began to work for another company which had different systems yes. that you felt comfortable with that you weren't going to, through your... Yes. Hepatitis consequences and symptoms yes. make any mistakes. Yeah. But I think you've had to adjust the way in which you work in order to accommodate that. Can you tell us a little about that? Yes. Well, I am working for another company now, also Australian. Um, they, they tend to pay better than the British companies. Um, and um, so I do work for them. I am actually still registered with Universal Credit because um, my hours are still quite limited and that really is linked to the depression and the associated uh, concentration, motivation issues and fatigue uh, and how long I can work each day. So um, some months I do better than others. Um, the work it tends to be pretty much, other than Christmas and so on, uh, always available, uh, but I am limited by how much of it I can take off from them. Uh, and that's sort of the current situation. So you're you're essentially working part time, doing what you feel physically and mentally able to do. Yes. Um, you're working purely from home. Yes. And that has both the benefit that you don't have the pressure of interaction with others, but the disadvantage for you of isolation. Yes. Yes. And I've I've taken steps. I've given myself a kick up the backside, and you know I've taken steps to try and get out a bit more. I've joined a choir again because I used to sing a lot and that kind of thing to, to sort of help that. But you say in your statement um, that you have a longer term worry about the future, um, that it, there's a, your future is unclear and you're concerned that there'll be a serious ongoing impact on your ability to obtain or sustain employment. Yes, I, th I think so, um, th and that's a bit of a mixture, n not just of how I feel within myself, but um, uh, the um, y y applying for a job outside of the home requires references, and I've not done so well, having been fired from a job and so on. And um, uh, last time I did have a, a, a an outside job where I was employed as opposed to self-employed, um, there were some issues there with the occupational health, um, discussing the hepatitis C infection and the, um, the de depression and so on. And they, uh, I, I did get the job, but there was quite a lot of kind of 
queries and questions over it. So I'm not sure how that would play in either. Um, but yes, it's mostly how well I think I could cope with it or whether I could get a job, or if I got a job, whether I could keep it. And I understand, again, from your statement that there was an impact upon um, your education because there was a particular qualification you were studying for. Uh, yes, I was doing a proofreading qualification because, I mean, I, I've, I've worked informally as a medical proofreader, um, but I wanted to get a formal proofreading qualification to allow me just to extend what I could do a bit and, and also because I was working from home, possibly get work um, outside of... Uh, yeah. When I'd done the proofreading work, it was mainly for the consultants I was working for, um, and I thought if I had a qualification, I could offer myself as a proofreader to possibly medical journals and the like, or in a non-medical area. Um, I, many years ago, went to theological college as well, and I thought maybe I could offer myself in that area, which has got some quite specialist language and so on. Uh, but I had to uh, give up the course before. I, I just couldn't study properly or, or get to finish that, so I had to give that up. And I think a number of years ago, before you were infected, you spent quite a lot of time travelling. Yes. Been to a number of different countries. Yes. And you described the, the change for you through the hepatitis C and the consequent depression as a change from being a highly self-motivated individual who taught herself languages to having no motivation or interest in doing anything at all. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. I mean, uh, you know, you, if, if you are somebody who knew me, um, even, I don't know, if, 10, 15 years ago, they probably describe me very differently. Um, I was um, well respected at work. I was very busy. Um, I did a lot of singing um, as, as a soloist and, and in groups in opera and uh, other areas. Um, I taught... Uh, I, I got together um, groups to learn to sing as a, as a choir, as, a, as a singers. Um, I taught singing, I taught uh, needlework and so on when we uh, had our shop. And before that, um, I was uh, involved, you know, I went overseas doing relief and development work. Um, I was... Um, quite involved uh, in the church I belong to with caring for homeless people um, and uh, I was a lay preacher and all these sorts of things and um, liked being able to uh, participate and, and be of you know give back to the community as it were um, and yeah um, and I've you know, reached the point where I really don't do anything and sort of try not to hide from the world. I've, I've been trying not to, especially for the last few months, but um, making positive steps there. But, uh, yes, it, it's been a real turnaround from the kind of life and it, the sort of person I was, I suppose, yeah. And you've got a close community of friends who've I've got, been a yes, tremendous support friend. to you. Yes. But you also say in your statement that your infections had an impact upon that relationship because uh, you've been a worry to them and you haven't been able to do with them some of the things you would have wanted to do. Yes, uh, again I think that's more the outcome with the link to fatigue and depression. Um, uh, yeah, at one point a few years ago my very best friend and she said it kindly um, said you know sometimes when you're in the room it's just like having a dark cloud in the room and that that was really painful um, and uh, and I've learnt ways over the years um, I, I now call myself a cheerful depressive <laughs> because um, quite a lot of people wouldn't know how I sometimes felt inside and actually um, sometimes I think, well, it's a choice how we, you know, or if a good friend of mine says you fake it, to make it, fake it to make it. And, uh, you know, there's some truth in that uh, if I choose to be cheerful, so, you know, it, it feels better and that's obviously better for my friends. So you're right, it, it was very painful to see the effect I was having on people that really cared a lot about me and... Um, 
you know, as I said, that was one of the things that really made me think about suicide because I didn't want to do that to them. Um, I think since then I've found ways of actually being better when I'm with people so that that hasn't got such a big impact on them. Now, you've told us about the financial impacts through your employment um, uh, and the Skipton uh, Fund, which you say you're, it's helpful, covers your mortgage, but isn't enough to cover bills, food, other outgoings. No. Um, can I just ask you about the Skipton Fund application? Yes. Um, you made an application in about... 2012 and you got the stage one payment which was the lump sum payment yes. uh, and then uh, in due course it was recommended to you by your doctors I think that you should apply for a stage two payment yes w what happened in relation to the progress progress of that stage two payment yeah well I'd been diagnosed with stage four fibrosis and the the word cirrhosis was sort of banded about and uh, the consultant said that was definitely uh, enough to to qualify for the second stage payments so I sent in the application form and you, you know the, the doctors fill that in and the uh, that was refused uh, and when I tried to find out why it appears that in the NHS they use a uh, in pathology they use the ISHAC staging system to classify levels of fibrosis of the liver um, and apparently it, at that stage it was borderline um, cirrhosis um, and it turned out that the uh, Skipton Fund people used a different staging system um, which was also borderline, but whereas in the NHS system I was over the border, <laughs> if with the um, Skipson system, I'm not sure what they called it, the classification system, I was slightly under. Um, and my consultant wrote back to them saying, you know, for, to all intents and purposes, Kate has this degree of liver damage, which is, you know, and, and she is eligible for this, um, but they refused it again, um, and I, I, yeah, I just left things at that point, and it was, um, I think, not quite sure of the timing, maybe it was a, a couple of years after that, that I had uh, a fibro scan which showed that the damage had increased um, quite a bit, and so um, it was suggested that I reapply and at that stage, the um, Skipton Fund granted me the second stage payment. Which I think you, you finally got in, in February 2017. That sounds about the date right. In this state. Yes. Uh, and so although you eventually got that, you'd, you'd spent some time trying to get it. Yes. But in fact, I understand there was a, quite a significant period of time, you're not sure exactly when, but between your diagnosis in 1997 uh, and um, more recent years, in which you, you simply weren't aware of the existence of the Skipton Fund at all, and so didn't make any no. application? No, I wasn't aware of it, and I was just rereading my notes uh, earlier and last night, and um, there is a note somewhere, um, I, I did write it down if it's important, in a letter, uh, 1416011, which is 2012, where the doctor there is actually confirming the diagnosis and he says he encouraged me to yeah. apply for Skipton Funny. Uh, even once I knew about it, actually, the initial payment, I decided not to apply for it because um, I, at the time I didn't realise what the implications would be financially. I, didn't, I wasn't in financial uh, uh, trouble at that time and uh, I'm a bit... Um, I don't like the idea of applying for compensation for the sake of it sort of thing. I wasn't quite sure if it was compensation anyway, but, um, um, you know, I'd raged on about, oh, UK is going to become like an America, you know, we're going to um, demand money for, you know, falling over a pin or whatever. Um, so it was, I think, a couple of years later when I really realised that I was struggling financially and that it was reasonable that I received the money and, and fair 
uh, and I applied for it then. That was the initial one, yeah. the initial stage payment. And, and the way you put it in your statement is, is after you, you did finally find out about the Skipton Fund and the, the precise dates don't, don't matter, Kate, you, you didn't apply for some time because you felt like you didn't deserve it. Yes, I, yes, I did, yeah. Um, uh, and then when you finally made your application for the stage two some years later, uh, you had debts, uh, and that's the point in which you realised you shouldn't be ashamed to take this money. Yes, yeah. Um, is there anything else, Kate, that you'd like to add? Uh, I don't think so. I'm just going to turn my back and ask Mr Snowden, who, as you know, represents you, yeah. if there's anything he has. Thank you. No, no. Okay. It remains for me to say thank you very much indeed, Kate, for coming to share your story with us. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. And that is the last witness for today. It is, sir. Who do we have tomorrow? So tomorrow we have three witnesses. We have, first of all, Claire Walton. Uh, we then have an anonymous witness, um, uh, uh, witness 140. Uh, and then we have a change to the schedule. We've had to reschedule a witness um, uh, until later on. Uh, and so we have instead Leslie Brown, who's very kindly agreed to give evidence at short notice. Uh, that's very... Very good of her. Thank you very much. Uh, so we shall start then at 10 o'clock. And I look forward to seeing you uh, and anyone else who wishes to be here at 10 o'clock in the morning. By all means, uh, stay for tea if, if there is any.